you have to drink it really fast before you can <laughs> talk. Um, right, okay, so uh, we get an afternoon with Joel Trock on concentrations. Um, you know, concentrations, all of us know them and love them. Uh, they're how you say that something bad doesn't happen. And she's like one line in a proof that some concentration with some Russian name is what you need to, to make it all go through. But you know, really it is a critical area of many of our fields. It's one of the few things that we all have in common. Um, so it, it gets interesting and complicated when we get into the multivariate situation where it's matrices. And uh, so we have a world expert on all the complications that arise and how to get around them here. And I think, Joel, you're going to do three one-hour lectures kind of that's a variant on our little model here. And we'll, we'll see how that goes. And I believe no PowerPoint, right? Well, there will be a little. Maybe a little. All right. Anyway, turn it over to Joel. Wake the computer back up. All right, so I'm going to begin with some prefatory remarks. Um, first of all, um, I'd really like to thank the organizers for their invitation. This is a beautiful new facility, and um, I'm excited to tell you about um, a recent strand of work on concentration and inequalities for matrix. We have three whole hours together, um, so I thought maybe I'd I don't know, tell you a little about my life. Um, maybe you, you'd like to hear about the time I got kidnapped in Morocco. Oh, yeah. um, okay, you don't want to hear that. So, um, all right. So, I am sensitive to the fact that we're going to be here for, together for three hours, and that, you know, as boring as it is to talk for three hours, it is even more boring to listen for three hours. And so, I'm going to do my very best to keep you engaged the whole time. Um, I'd like to invite you to put away your devices. Um, you'll probably find the talk more interesting if you're actually um, uh, interacting with me and uh, <laughs> <laughs> the slides. Of course, um, like Mike, I'm not going to enforce this rule except by glaring at you and uh, you're giggling at whatever comes up on your uh, um, Facebook feed. All right, so the first part of this talk will be on the slides, but I hate doing math on slides because it goes by way too fast. You can't understand anything. And um, so after some introductory remarks here on the overhead, we're going to switch to uh, the whiteboard and we'll do the rest of the presentation um, in ink. OK, so let's go. Oh, almost forgot. Uh, there are lecture notes on this material that I wrote for NIPS last year. And you can find them here at this address. So go ahead and download a copy if you like. The lecture notes have a whole lot of examples in them of the ideas that I'll be talking about in their applications. Today I'm not going to do so many examples. I'm going to do more in the way of math because I think that y'all might be more interested in understanding a bit about the ideas behind these tools rather than the slavish repetition of the application of these tools, which is basically the same every single time, um, as I'll emphasize. So I don't want to keep going through that over and over again. I'd rather tell you about some of the background. But um, you can get the notes here. There is also a set of um, um, slides from NIPS, which also has applications described. And if you'd really like to see the slavish repetition of one example after another, um, you can find it there. All right. So let me start out by telling you a little bit about where random matrices came from and where they are now. So um, Peter Forrester, who wrote a book on random matrices, traces the origins back to a paper of Hurwitz in 1898. Um, or maybe his collected works from 1898, but he was studying a problem in the geometry of numbers, and he had the need to average over a unitary group. And um, what is a random unitary matrix? Oh, sorry, what is a typical member of the unitary group but a random unitary matrix? And so his formula may be viewed as one of the first examples of random matrices in the literature. Um, these ideas really um, started to gather steam in statistics in the 20. So this um, smiling gentleman with the large forehead is John Wishart. Um, so he was interested in covariance estimation for multivariate normal distributions. This is back in the day before people had computers. And they did a lot of uh, their statistics by hand. And so it really helped to have analytic formulas that you could tabulate um, or work with analytically. And so he was interested in 
um, the behavior of a standard normal or a normal population and what its covariance, um, empirical covariance, would look like. So um, I've drawn a um, page out of his paper here. You can see multivariate distribution, use of quadratic coordinates where he changes variables to diagonalize this matrix, and then in gory detail cranks out the density of a um, matrix that we now know is a Wishart matrix. So here's the formula. It's um, not very enlightening. Um, but um, this is one of the first examples where this came up. And since then, um, statisticians have continued to use random matrices as models for data. And that was the application that he was interested in. OK. Um, the next place that I'm aware of that random matrices arose was in numerical linear algebra, which is um, due to John von Neumann, the smiling gentleman here with the large forehead. Um, so he's standing here next to um, the very first computer, um, which was um, built in the early 1950s. So before John von Neumann had this computer um, in the 40s, he started getting interested in the possibilities of using computers to solve numerical problems. You know, before that, computers were um, rooms full of usually women um, with note cards um, and adding machines who would crank through the computations by hand. Um, so he was interested in the prospects for the first digital computer. And one of the things he thought you might like to do with a digital computer is solve linear algebra problems. OK. So he, before he ever had a computer, invented the LUD composition of a matrix, identified the idea of rounding error analysis, performed a rounding error analysis for LUD composition, and um, described how you would implement this on a digital computer that at this point did not exist. So um, smart guy. Um, in the second paper he wrote on this subject, he thought that perhaps it would be a good idea to model the errors in these arithmetic computations as random. And so if you're working with a matrix and you're trying to decompose the matrix and you're making errors in the coordinates of the matrix, and you think about those errors as maybe being well modeled by something random, you wind up with a random matrix. And so John von Neumann said, well, maybe this is a good model. Let's investigate its properties. And so he worked out the um, tail bound here for the top eigenvalue of a random matrix that he thought might arise from his floating point computation. And you can see that the probability of the norm of the matrix exceeds such and such and um, so forth. So this was um, an example of random matrices in numerical linear algebra. As many of you may know, random matrices were subsequently banished from linear algebra, as was any other kind of randomness. And it wasn't until um, the late 90s with the work of um, Santosh Vampala and Ravi Kanan and uh, some of their colleagues that um, randomness really found its way back into this field as a central idea. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So random matrices were used to model floating point errors in linear algebra around 1950. Now, a third place where random matrices arose back in the day, um, this is perhaps one of the most famous, um, was in nuclear physics. So if you try and model um, nuclear reactions, you can understand <laughs> small atoms pretty easily using um, exact calculations. But when the atoms get bigger and more complicated, um, the physicists found that the techniques that they had just weren't tractable anymore. They weren't able to make computations to understand the energy spectra of these atoms as they were undergoing this um, type of slow nuclear reaction. So Eugene Wigner was the first researcher who had the surmise that perhaps they could model the Hamiltonian, the operator that described the evolution of this process, using a random matrix. So he proposed that in the early 1950s. And um, he is um, depicted here in his photo from the Nobel Foundation. He won the Nobel Prize um, for uh, work related to this. Um, so in a paper from the Annals of Math in 1955, he considered the matrix that's now known as a Wigner matrix, um, which is to say um, plus minus one random entries on the off diagonals and the diagonal entries with a different distribution. And so in this paper, he worked out the uh, what we now call the limiting spectral distribution of this matrix. and um, it turned out this is a rather good model for the um, energy spectra of a 
had the atom undergoing a slow nuclear reaction. So it was really a brilliant uh, connection that he made here. And subsequently, physicists really started um, wailing on the random matrices. Dyson developed uh, his threefold path. They studied um, a variety of other random matrices. And these matrices are now so well understood that people understand the um, higher order fluctuations of um, you know, any collection of 17 eigenvalues that you might wish to take. Um, and so this was really an extraordinarily successful line of research. And for the kind of random matrices that these techniques apply to, we know everything. Unfortunately, um, there are a lot of other random matrices about which we know nothing, um, which is to say most of them. And part of the purpose of the research I'll be telling you about this afternoon is to say something about other kinds of random matrices that don't come from these classical ensembles that the physicists um, understood um, so well starting from the 1950s. Okay, so why would you care about random matrices if you're not interested in slow nuclear reactions or multivariate statistics or in um, floating point errors? So let me tell you about a few of the applications that have come up in uh, recent history. So the first one I'd like to mention, which is um, um, getting highlighted here in part because we're going to have a tutorial on it um, later this week and has been one of the most successful applications is the role of randomness in linear algebra, more precisely in matrix approximation. Um, so the problem here is that you have a large matrix that's approximately low rank and you'd like to produce an approximation to that matrix. So. Um, People use this to do principal component analysis. There's a huge number of other applications that I'm not going to motivate for you. Um, and so it turns out that random matrices play a critical role in one of the basic algorithms for addressing this problem. So the idea here is that you'd like to approximate the range of A, um, which is a low dimensional subspace in the codomain of the matrix. Remember, it's a low rank matrix, so it basically kills a whole bunch of the dimensions. So you can think of the, age, the range as being a flat. And the way that you can go about doing this is by pulling a random vector out of the sky, multiplying this into the matrix A, and you'll obtain a vector here in the range. OK, so you found one direction in the range. OK, let's try that again. We'll reach up in the sky. We'll pull down another random vector. We'll multiply it in the matrix A. And we'll get another vector here in the range of the matrix. Now, it's random, so it's probably not pointed the same direction as the first vector we pulled out. So we found another direction. OK, this is looking promising. So we'll repeat this for a while. And eventually, after we've pulled k random vectors, if the range of A is k dimensions, We'll have a collection of k linearly independent vectors in a k-dimensional space. And of course, those vectors then span that space. So if we want to find a basis for the range of the matrix, all we have to do is orthogonalize those vectors. OK. So we can express this in terms of um, random matrices in the following way. We assume that we have a target matrix A that we'd like to approximate. We collect those random vectors, omega 1 up to omega k, into the columns of a random matrix omega. We multiply that random matrix into A to obtain a random matrix Y, whose columns are the vectors here on the right-hand side. And by forming a QR decomposition of Y to expose its range, we can construct a basis for the range of A. Okay? So this is a very simple algorithm for finding the range of a low rank matrix using randomness. And what makes this algorithm tick are the properties of this random matrix omega. So to understand the behavior of this algorithm, you need to understand how the random matrix omega interacts with the target matrix A that you're trying to approximate. And you will learn a lot more about that later this <coughs> week from um, one of our colleagues who's giving that talk. You? Petros. Both of you? All right. So um, these guys are the leading experts on this problem. And um, you'll see very precisely how you need to understand random matrices to understand this type of algorithm. Okay. So this is a very successful approach. But there are all sorts of other algorithmic applications of random matrices that members of um, our community and other communities have developed. So here's a quick tour of some of these ideas. So there's the idea of random sparsification. Say someone hands you a huge matrix and you'd like to perform a spectral computation. One way to do that is to randomly throw away most of the entries, just zero them out, and then rescale the entries that you decide to keep. 
Now you've got a sparse matrix, and on average it sort of looks like the matrix that you started with. And so you can perform the spectral computations on the sparse matrix instead of the original matrix you started with. And sparse linear algebra tends to be faster than dense linear algebra, so this may be a way to accelerate those computations. So one way random matrices arise in applications is through sparsification, randomly zeroing out entries. Um, people use subsampling. So Mike Jordan probably talked a little bit about this this morning in connection with the um, bootstrap. So the bag yes? But that you don't mean uniformly at random? No. Okay. No, you need to throw the entries away in proportion to their magnitude. Um, so there's some nice papers on that by um, Christos um, Vucidis and Petros Trineus and um, Tasso Zuzius and a bunch of other folks. Demetrius Akleoptis. You'll notice these guys are all Greek. Um, I don't know what that means. <laughs> okay. I'm Greek too. Ah, so <laughs> you, you'll probably have some insight on this then. <laughs> all right, um, subsampling. So people throw away um, portions of the data in an effort to compute kernels approximately. Dimension reduction, we heard about that in the last talk by Alex Andoni. So we might want to perform a nearest neighbor calculation for data in a very high dimensional space. One way to do that is to squash the data into a low dimensional space by multiplying it into a random matrix. And the properties of the random matrix are essential to understanding the performance of the dimension reduction method. Um, another method I really like because it has a different flavor from the first three where you're taking data and tossing a whole bunch of it out randomly and then analyzing how much damage you did using the properties of random matrices is an application in combinatorial optimization. So um, the method of relaxation and rounding. The idea here is you have a very hard optimization problem that you would like to solve, but it's intractable. So instead, you replace it by a close-by problem that is tractable. You solve the tractable problem. And then after you've got a solution to that, you apply some random procedure to take the solution from the tractable problem and round it back to a solution to the intractable problem that satisfies the constraints of the original problem. And if your decision variable happened to be a matrix, you would really need to understand random matrices to push through this calculation. So there's some very nice papers on um, um, matrix optimization problems involving spectral norm constraints and quadratic constraints that use exactly these kinds of ideas. So random matrices play a role in combinatorial optimization as well. So these are all ways in which understanding the properties of random matrices is essential to um, develop and analyze um, modern algorithms. Okay, any questions on any of these? So when I got learned how to um, teach uh, when I was at the University of Michigan as a postdoc, they um, warned me that if you don't wait at least six seconds after asking a question, um, no one will have had an opportunity to actually formulate a question. Um, so uh, that explains the um, lengthy and awkward pauses um, after I ask you whether you have any questions. So. We are asking questions. See? <laughs> <laughs> on your last slide. Was it uh, von Neumann's theorem, the upper bound on the spectral norm of random matrix yeah. first proved by von Neumann, is it? Or? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's in this 1951 paper with Goldstein. Um, that predates Wigner? No, that yes, it predates Wigner. Yeah. Um, goes back a long way. Okay. Anything else? Perhaps yeah. a comment oh. is that you, you didn't mention that there is a whole line in the theory of Banach spaces. Mm -hmm. And that starts, I, I would imagine, I'm not sure, perhaps late 60s. Late yeah, Millman's work on concentration and measures um, certainly ha can be interpreted in terms of the properties of random matrices. Um, I guess I'll mention a couple other things while we're at it. In terms of combinatorics, uh, you can certainly model the adjacency matrix of a random graph as a random matrix. And by understanding its second eigenvalue, say, you can understand something about the connectivity or the mixing properties of a walk on, random walk on the graph. Um, another place this turned up in the early 70s was in Montgomery's work on the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. It turns out that the eigenvalues of a random matrix provide an excellent model for the spacing of the zeros of the zeta function. So these things are everywhere. Um, these days it's, I think, kind of hard to find a field that um, has not been touched by random matrix theory. Um, anything else? <laughs>
Okay, so um, this isn't by any means comprehensive. It's just intended to be motivational. Um, okay, another place that random matrices come up um, is when we try to model data. Now, I like to um, place a caveat on this slide, which is that um, models um, do not necessarily describe reality um, with any accuracy. And so one of the dangers is that people analyze um, algorithms or other methods by considering a random model and then forget that they uh, were modeling something and um, become convinced that the outcome of their analysis is an actual description of reality. Okay, these are just models. They may be more or less accurate descriptions of what's going on in the background. They may be more or less informative, but they do let you try to say something about the behavior of um, algorithms or um, other kinds of um, computational problems in a sort of average setting. Now, whether that average setting looks anything like anything you would ever encounter um, uh, is a point <laughs> that should be investigated. Okay, so um, high dimensional data analysis. This is like a wish arts example with that um, um, multidimensional Gaussian model. So statisticians love using random matrices to model multivariate data. Um, sometimes it's a good model, maybe other times not so much, but very popular. Um, wireless communications. So um, you can use a random matrix to model um, the fading in a wireless channel. And um, Tulino and Verdu have been very successful in applying methods for random matrix theory to understand these problems. And it appears this is actually a pretty good model for um, this type of phenomenon. Um, and uh, one other example, um, if you have a superposition of two structured signals, um, an important algorithmic problem in signal processing is to pull those two signals apart from each other using the fact that they're structured. And um, if you assume that the two signals are oriented randomly with respect to each other, they don't have anything in common, then you can often solve this problem using um, optimization-based algorithms. And um, this random model for the orientation of the signals really is very important to help understand how these algorithms perform. Whether it describes actual signal processing problems, well, hard to say. But in all of these cases, the behavior of a random matrix is essential to understanding um, a computational or statistical problem. Okay, one um, other place that random matrices come up um, is in theoretical applications. People use these as um, examples or counterexamples for a variety of problems. So one place it comes up in the theory of algorithms is in the smooth analysis of Gaussian elimination. So we know that if you perform Gaussian elimination on a worst case matrix, matrices, okay. on a worst case matrix, the sequence of pivots can grow exponentially quickly. But that never actually happens. And one compelling theoretical explanation for why that might be the case is um, the smoothed analysis due to Dan Spielman and um, uh, his collaborators, in which um, he showed that um, for most matrices close to a given matrix, the pivots don't grow. Okay? And that depends essentially on the property of a fixed matrix plus a small random matrix. Okay? So, um, random matrices play a role in the smooth analysis problem. Um, they come up in combinatorics. So one of the simplest constructions of an expander graph is via a random matrix. Um, they come up in high-dimensional geometry, um, as has uh, been pointed out. So for example, if you're interested in the structure of a random slice of a high-dimensional body, um, you can interpret this as um, a spectral property of a random matrix. And very recently, we've seen these things coming up in quantum information theory as um, counterexamples to very natural conjectures about the capacity of a quantum channel. And um, again, the properties of these random matrices were really essential to understanding um, um, or to producing these counterexamples. So these things are everywhere. These theoretical applications are nice because you know the math is true. So it's not like the models where the model could be a good model or a bad model. These um, really do demonstrate, um, in the first case, the, um, something about the behavior of an algorithm or the existence of a combinatorial object or um, a counterexample about um, how we can transmit information through a quantum system. Okay. Any questions on any of this background? When you say random matrix, are you referring to any mechanism? <coughs> Yeah, I mean a measurable map from a. Um, <laughs> not, not necessarily 
very general. And that's the trouble. Like, if someone says, here's a random matrix whose entries are independent and identically distributed standard normal variables, then we know everything about that matrix. I mean, this is, of course, a huge achievement. But um, in particular, I'm including examples that are a lot more um, um, fussy. Yeah. Um, I'm not in, like you said, for only for Gaussian, because you said for minus 1, 1, we also know everything. No, we don't, actually. It turns yeah. out that this is shockingly hard. Because, um, yeah, I, mean, I remember at some point there was this, um, mm -hmm. you know, eigenvector, L infinity norm sort That's of right. question that remains. Yeah. I think that uh, there's been a little bit of progress on this recently, localization of eigenvectors for somewhat general matrices with independent entries. But it's within log n. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. She was asking about um, whether we know everything about uh, matrices whose entries are random plus minus one variables. We still don't even know how likely such a matrix is to be seen. Right. I mean, oh, yeah. yeah, these problems are extraordinarily difficult, in part because the distributions are discrete, but um, it's in part because they don't have the same kind of symmetries as a, a Gaussian matrix. So um, when I say we know everything, I'm really referring to a very small number of classical ensembles. And beyond that, um, sea dragons. <laughs> I mean, it's not really much of an exaggeration. Um, more questions? This is just to persuade you that what we're going to be talking about is somewhat relevant and um, interesting. Now, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my approach to random matrices. Now, um, I read an article in the New York Times that said that if you sing My Way in a karaoke bar in the Philippines, someone will knife you. Um, and I'm hoping this audience is a little gentler. Um, and, hmm? You plan to sing it? <laughs> well, if I went down that road, you would not be gentle. Um, so... Um, in particular, I'd like to emphasize this isn't really my approach to solving ran, um, problems involving random matrices. This is really a method that's developed over the last 15 years or so with the contributions of a whole lot of people. Some of them are indicated at the bottom of the slides. But um, I think really in the last few years, it's become clear that there is an alternative approach to dealing with a lot of random matrices that come up in practice. And um, it's extremely powerful. Um, although it does have some limitations of its own. Okay. And, uh, yes? Uh, one more comment about uh, combinatorics. There, there is, of course, uh, the uh, rent increasing, uh, sub ah. almost increasing subsequence exactly, mm -hmm. which at least should be mentioned as one of the nicest connections between random matrix theory and combinatorics. Yes. So. Um, another important example in combinatorics is um, the problem of the length of the longest increasing um, subsequence in a random uh, randomly permuted sequence. Um, so this was studied by Jinho Bake and um, some other folks, and uh, um, there are some connections with random matrices, but I'm not really that familiar with the work. So, all right. So um, let me tell you about a couple principles to. Um, addressing random matrix problems that um, um, have sort of become clear over the last few years. So um, back in the 1980s, there was a Barbie doll um, that was released on the market that had a little string. You could pull the string, and it would say various um, kind of offensive things, um, one of which is that um, math is tough. Um, now, of course, the irony in that case is that, as we all know, math is, in fact, tough, and Barbie was entirely correct on this point. <laughs> so her detractors, perhaps, were um, didn't appreciate the depth of that comment. Um, you can find um, a video of <laughs> this Barbie doll on YouTube if you're interested. Um, but of course, I know you put away all your devices, so it'll have to wait. Um, I think another piece of evidence in favor of this point, if you don't trust Barbie's opinion, is um, to have a look at any monograph on random matrix theory. And this will persuade you of my point. Um, and I don't mean this as to detract from the work that people have done, which is beautiful and remarkable, but it is not easy. Um, I spent a long time trying to learn a lot of this material without a lot of success. Um, and I don't think it's because of the exposition. I think it's just because this stuff is hard. And it really requires a large investment of time. It requires, ideally, the help of a practitioner who can um, show you what's important, um, teach you about the intuitions behind the different methods, help you see your way through you know, moment calculations that go on for 10 pages. Um, 
it's a really very sophisticated area. What I'm going to tell you about is kind of brain dead. And um, that's part of the reason I think it's useful. Um, it allows um, us to solve lots and lots of random matrix problems without much fuss. It doesn't always get exactly the right answer, but it usually comes close enough that it r can be very informative about the behavior of algorithms or statistical procedures or um, a variety of other problems that arise in the theory of big data. Um, <coughs> all right. So there are two principles behind this method. The first one is that in lots of applications, the random matrix you care about can be written as a sum of independent random matrices. So I have denoted this with a giant sigma. Um, we have a random matrix Z, and we have written it as a sum of some other random matrices SK, which are independent from each other. So it turns out this is shockingly common. Um, there are lots and lots of situations where you can chop a complicated random matrix into pieces that are a lot simpler and that are independent from each other. And so if you can understand the properties of those sum ands, then you can tie all this together to understand properties of the random matrix Z. So that's the first principle. We can write random matrices as sums of independent random matrices or nearly independent. There are a variety of um, alternatives. And second of all, there are exponential concentration inequalities for the spectral norm of a sum of independent random matrices. So this is the um, second part of this um, approach. So once you've understood that Z can be decomposed in this fashion, then you can harness the properties of those sum ands SK to fill in the blank here and understand the likely size of the spectral norm of Z. And it turns out for a lot of applications, that's all the information you need. So two principles, right? Random matrices as independent sums, and then apply concentration inequalities to understand the eigenvalues of the random matrix. Okay. Maybe you'll get to this, but can you get from Neumann's theorem up or down on the spectral norm? Yep. Is well, no, 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 because there's an extra log factor. Log. Okay. Yeah. So um, this is one of the trade-offs you make. I'll touch on this in a minute. Any question about these two principles? I'm only doing one example today. Normally, I beat people over the head with this for um, two to three hours, where I proceed to chop up random matrices into independent sums and then um, beat them to death with inequalities. Um, today, we're going to be talking about math instead, because it's um, a little less repetitive. Um, any questions on this? So um, let me summarize the vision here behind this work. Um, and again, this isn't uh, my vision. It's um, sort of the culmination of a lot of research in this area. Okay. So random matrices are hard to deal with. We're going to write them as an independent sum and apply a package concentration inequality. And usually this amounts to some arithmetic, half a page or a page of work, and we get very strong results um, on the behavior of the random matrix. Now. Um, the two pluses are that there's a very wide range of applicability, and these methods are very simple to use. I'll try and provide some concrete evidence of that for you in a minute. The minus is that sometimes you lose a log factor. So in contrast with the classical ensembles like matrices with Gaussian entries about which we know everything, we don't get quite the right answer in some situations. But the loss is controlled, it's pretty small, and so for a lot of problems, doesn't really matter. As um, it said, what is a logarithm between friends? So um, my group and I have all sorts of papers about this. This is um, mostly um, painfully technical. Um, but as I indicated, there is a set of lecture notes that introduces some of these ideas. And there are a lot of examples in the lecture notes. So I'm going to refer you to the lecture notes for most of the examples. But in case you get really enthusiastic about this, there's a lot of reading you can do. Um, and they're actually still interesting open questions if anyone wishes to discuss that later on uh, this fall. OK, any questions on the sort of preparatory remarks about why you should care about random matrices or the approach we're going to take to studying them? All right, the six seconds are up, and uh, we will now move to the blackboard. All right, 
Yeah. Away from the turn Okay, so let's do an example of a familiar matrix that can be chopped into independent pieces. So this example comes from statistics and goes in some sense all the way back to Wishart. And this is the sample covariance matrix. So here's the setup. We have a statistical problem where somewhere in the universe there is a population um, of multivariate subjects. And we'll introduce a random vector x that contains the distribution of each one of those variables for a given subject. So this is a random vector. It clearly has a length p. And we're going to assume that the expectation of this random vector is 0. So all the variables have 0 mean, um, just to simplify the discussion. Obviously, there's correlation. I mean, the coordinates can be correlated. The coordinates may be correlated, but each one is 0 mean. You can do all this without 0 mean, but it's just more stuff to carry around. OK, so the covariance matrix describes the correlations. And we obtain this by multiplying x by its transpose and computing the expectation. So the entries of this matrix are xj times xk multiplied together and averaged. And because these are zero mean, these really are coral, uh, sorry, covariances. Okay? So the covariance matrix is a p by p matrix that tabulates the covariance between each pair of entries in the matrix uh, in the random vector x. Okay, so we would like to estimate a from data. Okay, so what kind of data might we hope to have collected? Well, we might believe that we have drawn independent copies of the random vector x. So if this is some subject, we imagine that there are n identical copies of this subject and that we've interrogated each one of them to find out the values of each of these p variables. So freshmen at Berkeley, and we found out their SAT scores and their free throw percentage and um, I don't know, the number of um, shops that they drink on a typical Friday night and all these other things. Okay, So we've collected n independent copies of the random vector. And the natural approach to trying to estimate the covariance is to form the sample covariance, which is the random matrix, I'm going to denote a hat, which is obtained by taking each one of the random vectors, forming its outer product, and averaging them together. So this is uh, what's called a plug-in estimator. We've taken the formula for the covariance, and we've plugged in the data. OK. Now, we would really like the sample covariance matrix to be a good estimator for the covariance. And we'd like to understand just how well or how badly we've done with this estimate. Now, this is random, so different realizations are going to be better or worse. And um, first of all, we can take note that um, this is a reasonable estimate because by the linearity of expectation, this is just um, the expectation of the sample covariance is this guy. Each one of these is the covariance. There are n copies. We divide by n, and so we get the covariance matrix. So in other words, the sample covariance is an unbiased estimator for the covariance. And by the way, we have used a zero mean assumption to 
make sure this all works out neatly. Okay, so it's a good estimate on average, but in any particular case, any particular draw of the data, how well did we do? Well, the idea is that we're going to analyze this by using matrix concentration inequalities. Now, what makes us think that we could apply these ideas? Any thoughts? Why, look, it is a sum of independent random matrices. You can see how this gets tiring pretty fast. Um, so A hat is a sum of independent random matrices. And so we will apply matrix concentration. OK, so we don't know any matrix concentration inequalities yet, so I'm going to have to tell you about one. So the result I'm going to tell you about is probably the most useful of the matrix concentration inequalities. And it is a result known as matrix Bernstein. Um, how many of you are familiar with the scalar Bernstein inequality? Um, but not everyone. OK. Um, so, sir. You can, but it depends on the kind of error estimate that you want to get. Um, so if you'd like to get a spectral norm error estimate, which tells you in particular that you've done a good job estimating every marginal of the distribution, then you really need um, something stronger than entry-wise. And the trouble is there are a lot of marginals that you might have to control. So that's actually the difficulty in this problem. So what we're going to want is an estimate for this kind of quantity here. So how far is um, the sample covariance estimator from the covariance? Okay. So it's not that we have any question about wanting this. This is really is what we want if we want to understand the marginals of the distribution. So change that to a period. Okay, so the result that we're going to use is um, something called the matrix Bernstein inequality. So there are a bunch of people who contributed to the development of this result. Um, so um, I'm going to write down a couple names here. Um, David Gross. Um, actually, let me start out with um, Oswald and Winter. I'll tell you more about these guys in a little bit and their contribution. Um, so David Gross, I think in 2009, um, developed a matrix Bernstein inequality. Ben Recht um, in 2009 developed a matrix Bernstein inequality. Um, Roberto Oliveira um, in 2010 developed a weaker version of this and independently um, in 2010 I developed uh, the version that I'm going to show you. So um, lots and lots of folks have contributed to this um, and these two results are roughly equivalent. And that's what I'm going to be telling you about. So here's the idea. We're going to let S1 up to Sn be independent D1 by D2 matrices. So each one of these sumands is independent from the others. Each one is a D1 by D2 random matrix. <coughs> We're going to assume that the expectation of SK is equal to 0 for each K. If not, you should center them. And we're going to assume that each one of these SKs is uniformly bounded. So this is the spectral norm here. It's the maximum singular value of the matrix. This bound is not random. So we are assuming that the some ands are bounded uniformly. Okay. Now, under these assumptions, we'll consider the random matrix. Um, 
z that we obtain by summing up the sk. And we'll define a variance sigma squared, which is the expectation of the square of z. But z is two squares because it's a rectangular matrix. And remember, this is the maximum. So we're going to compute the variance of z, which is this quantity. It's the expectation of the square, the left square, and the right square. And once we have all of this material, we can write down a concentration and equality for the spectral norm of z. So the probability that the norm of z exceeds some level t is less than or equal to d1 plus d2 times the exponential of minus t squared over 2 divided by sigma squared plus rt divided by 3. Okay, so if you've seen the matrix Bernstein inequality, then this will look awfully, f sorry, if you've seen the scalar Bernstein, if you've seen the matrix one, it will look extremely familiar. <laughs> if you've seen the scalar version, it will look somewhat familiar. So this is exactly the formula that you learn about in um, an introductory probability class or in a um, randomized algorithms class or whatever. Um, it tells you that for small t, you see sub-Gaussian behavior. For large t, you see better than sub-exponential behavior. The variance locally is controlled by sigma squared, which is this thing I'm calling the variance. The only difference really is this dimensional factor, d1 plus d2. Um, one second. If um, this, these were scalars, d1 plus d2 would be 2, which is just what you see in the scalar case. And if you've actually got a matrix, then this could be pretty big. So you have to eat a dimensional factor. And the other difference is that the variance doesn't look quite like it did in the scalar case, although it reduces to the scalar variance if these are one by one random matrices. Okay? So this really is an extension of the Bernstein inequality that you know and um, love. All right. Um, Um, or which range so, is it better or whatever? Yeah, so this is always better than Allsvetter winter. Um, and the reason is because, um, roughly speaking, they have their, um, um, the, their variance parameter is wrong. I mean, that's true, but it's um, often a factor of um, the dimension larger than it ought to be. So it really doesn't get the right prediction in general. Um, I can explain more about that in the next lecture when I talk about how you prove stuff like this. Might want to say yes. that later, perhaps, but the, it's very important that the expectation and insight the norm. Right? Absolutely. You're going to say yes. That. And by the way, really the interesting thing about this result, in my view, is not the tail bound. It's the fact that the expectation of the norm is controlled by um, 2 sigma squared um, log of uh, d1 plus d2 plus. Um, R divided by 3 times the log of d1 plus d2. So this tells you that, um, that up to this logarithm, the variance and the upper bound control the spectral norm of this random matrix. And this result is sharp in the sense that there are random matrices where you will see these logarithms, um, the example that we're going to finish in just a minute. And um, this is never any smaller than the result without the logarithms. Okay, so this really is the right answer. Yeah. Is there an example of the variance of the spectral norm? Um, no, this is the expectation. So the you see the um, variance is under the square root. So it um, this is sort of like standard deviation kind of quantity. Um, so this respect, uh, reflects the moderate deviations, and this reflects the large deviations. So this is like a sub-Gaussian um, term, and this is a sub-exponential consequence of the sub-exponential part. Yes? That uh, third condition that the norm of SK is bounded, Yep. Uh, that doesn't hold for your example, does it? Um, it will after I impose it. <laughs> <laughs>
He's two steps ahead. Um, okay. Um, any questions about the statement? So John, just to understand this. Yes, this Petros. is exactly the problem that Ben has, right? Um, no. It is not exactly the bound Ben has. Is um, it some constant because he's assuming these guys are identically distributed, basically. Oh, okay. Yes. okay. So not identically distributed doesn't work the same way. And it's different from Oliveira because Oliveira actually has rank one matrices. Uh, um, in the same that's matrix. not so important. What's important is that um, somehow, OK, I can write out this variance more explicitly since this question has come up twice now. Um, Sorry, I'll say that they assume identical. Yeah. They do. Yeah. It's not necessary for their proof, but um, you get the wrong answer for um, things that are not identically distributed. I think maybe it's best just to leave it at that right now. Um, like I said, I'm mindful of the fact that um, I've only been talking for a third as long as I'm going to be talking, and that y'all would probably like some coffee just about now. A anything else? A similar statement true if you um, go to some kind of bounded differences condition? Uh, yeah. Um, you can prove a bounded differences result. Um, that's a bit harder. Um, there's another method that's a bit better for bounded differences, but there is a matrix hoofing inequality, matrix Azuma, all of them. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, okay. Are there any results on Gaussianity, but the appropriate, the appropriate norm story, in other words, really controlling the Gaussianity in what sense? Oh, you mean like a Gaussian central limit theorem, theorem type thing? Yeah. No, I don't think anyone's shown anything like that just yet. Um, actually, no, that's not true because if you look at the Bonox, the operator value of central limit theorems in a Bonox space, I mean, it tells you that these things look like that it, long independent sums converge to um, um, like. Uh, <sighs> Um, Gaussian measures and um, extreme generality, and that work goes back to certainly at least the 80s. I mean, it's all in the doing Talagrand. So you can certainly leverage um, or take advantage of that kind of um, a deep result to, for the specific example. Okay. All right, so let's apply this to this, and uh, then we'll um, take a break. So what do we need to do to study the... Um, sample covariance matrix. So we need some ands. So the some ands here in our error estimate are 1 over n times xk, xk transpose minus a. So we've just taken the definition of a hat, the sample covariance estimator, plugged it in here, and multiplied and divided a by n. OK? So um, a hat minus a is equal to the sum of these sk. And these sk are evidently independent. They're zero mean because the expectation of this guy equals A. All right, so we've got um, the first two conditions down. What about uniform boundedness? Well, we don't have that, as has been pointed out. So we're going to assume that into existence. Um, so we're going to assume that x squared is uniformly bounded by a number B. Okay. So we're not talking about general distributions. We're talking about bounded distributions. And with this assumption, we can place a uniform bound on the sum ands. So we have space for this. No, we need another board. Okay, so under this assumption, we can bound SK as 1 over n times XK, XK transpose plus A. Um, and I'm going to rewrite A as the expectation of XX transpose. OK, now we apply the triangle inequality for the norm and Jensen's inequality for the expectation. 
Oh, you're absolutely right. Um, so now we apply the uniform bound for this norm and this one. And we obtain an estimate of 2b over n for each one of the sum ands. So each of the sum ands is uniformly bounded, which uh, is not a surprise because they're identically distributed, and we're assuming this distribution um, is bounded. OK. Now the last piece, we need to compute the variance. So this is uh, particularly easy in this case because this is a symmetric matrix, and so sk SK transpose equals SK transpose SK is equal to SK squared. So this thing here is only going to have one term in it instead of two. And so the expectation of SK squared is 1 over N squared times the expectation of um, xk squared times xk, xk transpose, minus xk, xk transpose times a, minus xk trans, uh, whoops, minus a times xk, xk transpose, plus a squared. So all we've done here is expanded the square. Now, this is bounded by B, and this is non-negative, so we can make this larger in the semi-definite order by replacing this with B. And once we do that, we can just compute the expectation. So this is dominated by 1 over N squared times the expectation of B times the covariance A minus A times A minus A times A so a squared minus a squared plus a squared. And these three combine to produce a matrix that's non-positive. And so in summary, the expectation of one of these sum ands is 1 over n squared times b times a in the semi-definite order. All right, now we're prepared to compute this variance. And as soon as we compute the variance, we can apply the theorem. So, expectation of z squared is equal to the expectation of the sum of SK times SJ, where J and K range over all of the possible values of the indices. But these guys are independent when the indices are different, and they are mean 0. So this collapses to the diagonal terms. And so we can just substitute in our bound here. Where we've used the fact that the sum has n terms. And now we just simplify this to b over n times the norm of a. Okay, so you need to be a little bit careful introducing things, um, inequalities into spectral norms, but this calculation is pretty reasonable, and it gives you an estimate for the variance parameter of the, um, sorry, the random matrix should have been, um, a hat minus a. All right, now, we have everything we need to apply this theorem. 
And so we discovered that the expectation of a hat minus a is less than or equal to the square root of 2 times b over n times norm a, this is sigma squared, times the logarithm of the dimension of the matrix, d1 and d2. So what are the dimensions of z? Well, this is a covariance matrix for p variables, so it's just p by p. So both of the dimensions equal p. So the first term here is log 2p. And then we have this uniform bound here that we need to include. So the uniform bound is 2b over n. And again, we have the logarithm of 2p. OK, so we've computed the expected error or a bound on the expected error in the sample covariance matrix as an estimator of the sample uh, as an estimator of the covariance and the error is in the spectral norm so it's very strong it controls every marginal of the distribution all right now what does this mean so if we would like this to be smaller than epsilon what we need is that the number of samples n is going to be bigger than a constant times b log of 2p divided by epsilon squared times the spectral norm of the matrix A, the covariance. So if we want a small error, this is the number of samples we need. So most of the time, in applications of interest, B is going to be about equal to P, the number of variables. And the conclusion that you reach then is that you need N to be something like P log P over epsilon squared is the number of samples to perform accurate covariance estimation. Okay. This is sharp for worst case distributions. <coughs> and this calculation, which took a little longer than I might have liked, but nevertheless can be completed on two chalkboards, um, establishes um, a result from Rudelson's paper in 1999 on um, the distributions of isotropic random vectors. This is considered a major result. Um, before this time, you really needed to have really the, like the intellect and talent of Jean Bourguin to produce um, results of this form. Now, it amounts to a piece of arithmetic that you can do on a chalkboard at the end of a one-hour lecture. So that's the value of these results. You can get results that are often accurate or close to accurate with a minimum of effort, even if they aren't uh, quite as informative as the very best results for um, the standard ensembles. Um, it should be said that for um, distributions on X that are not worst case, you don't need that logarithm, and this result won't tell you that. So that's the trade-off. Calculation that fits on these boards, but it can't tell you whether or not the logarithm belongs. So for many purposes, um, that's adequate. Okay, let's take a break and we'll start again in um, um, 15 minutes. Thank you.